Hello, my name is Cheryl Bernhardt. I'd like to introduce this session to you by emphasizing the importance of good written communication skills. Quality written communication skills are important to you not only during your education, but certainly also during your career. Regardless of the type of career you have chosen, we all have the need to effectively communicate in writing. The quality of your writing will be judged not only on the content of the message, but also on the grammar and punctuation skills that you use to prepare that message into a final appropriate format. This session is designed to assist you in reviewing the basics of grammar and also commonly used punctuation marks so that you can develop effective written communication skills. As you develop quality in your written communication skills, it's important to go back and review grammar basics. Let's begin with a review of basic parts of speech. First of all, a noun. A noun in a sentence names a person, place, or thing. A proper noun names a specific person, specific place, or specific thing, such as a specific person, Abraham Lincoln, a specific place, the Grand Canyon, or a specific thing, the Empire State Building. In each of these, we are identifying a specific, and when you do so, proper nouns are capitalized. Common nouns, however, do not reference a specific person, place, or thing, and capitalization is not required. A collective noun is composed of individual persons or things. Examples include a team, certainly composed of individual team members, but as a collective noun, the word team represents the individual persons or things collectively. Another example would be class, composed of individual students. A compound noun represents two or more words used as a single unit to name a person, place, or thing. Compound nouns can be hyphenated or shown without hyphens. In the examples on the screen, you see sister-in-law, an example of multiple words put together to represent a single separate definition, and this particular compound noun requires hyphenation. Income tax is an example of, again, two words put together to represent a distinct and separate unit. This compound noun does not require hyphenation. You may check with a dictionary to determine whether or not hyphenation is required when forming compound nouns. A plural noun represents more than one person, place, or thing, such as the word employees, shown here with the letter S, and most English plural forms represent the plural with the letter S, ES, or IES. A possessive noun is a noun showing ownership or possession. In the example, you see companies' assets. The possessive is, is represented with the apostrophe S. Singular possessive forms are shown with the apostrophe S, and regular plural nouns are shown with the S apostrophe. For irregular plural forms, those that do not end in the letter S, such as man to men or woman to women, the apostrophe S format would be shown as the possessive noun format. A verb shows action or movement or describes a situation or condition. Examples, throw, listen, be, run. An infinitive is the word to, T-O, plus a verb, such as to send. The verb tense 
recognizes that the form of a verb places the action or condition in a particular time frame. Is it happening now, in the present? Has it happened in the past? Or is it a past participle form? Irregular verbs do not show its parts in the usual way by adding ed to the present part to form the past part and past participle. An example of irregular verb forms include go, went, and gone. An adjective is a word or word group that describes a noun or pronoun, such as a good investment or a shiny car. In these two examples, the word good is the adjective describing the investment and shiny describing the noun car. The words a, an, and the are used as adjectives and they are referred to as articles such as the stock market. In this sentence the word the is defined as the article used again as a adjective describing the stock market. An adverb is a word that describes a verb, an adjective, or another adverb. In the example drive safely, the word safely is the adverb. A conjunction is a connector. It connects words, phrases, or clauses. Commonly used conjunctions include and, but, or, and nor. A preposition is also a connector in a sentence. It connects a noun or pronoun to another word in the sentence. Commonly used prepositions include of, for, in, between and except. A pronoun is a word that functions as the substitute for a noun in a sentence. Words such as I or we or there are all examples of pronouns. A personal pronoun is a word that substitutes for the name of a specific person or thing. Uh, he or she are commonly used personal pronouns. An indefinite pronoun does not represent a specific person, place, or thing, such as someone or something, anyone or anything. When you are selecting the personal pronoun to use in a sentence, the selection of a personal pronoun depends on the case form required. Is it in the subjective case? Objective? or possessive. Here you see a list of commonly used subjective pronouns and commonly used objective pronouns. For example, I would be the subjective pronoun, me the objective case, he subjective, him objective, she subjective, her objective, we subjective, us, objective, they, subjective, them, objective, and who, subjective, whom, objective. It's important to know the rules when to use the subjective versus objective case forms. The first rule describing the need to use the subjective pronoun case form includes any pronoun that is the subject of a verb, meaning it is the subject of the action within the sentence. Examples, I completed the assignment. Again referring back to the list, we know that I is a subjective pronoun. Me would be the objective case. I is the subject of the sentence, subject of the verb. I completed the assignment. So it requires the subjective case form. You would not say, me completed the assignment. In the second example, we see a compound using Rachel and she are good managers. In a compound situation, you can mentally omit Rachel and, and you can still very clearly identify that she is the subject of the verb. 
she is a good manager. Because we have Rachel and she, we of course are required to use the plural verb are. The second rule that summarizes when to use the subjective case form includes any pronoun that completes the meaning of a being verb. An easy way to remember this is any pronoun that follows the words am, is, are, was, were, be, or been is in the subjective case. Examples. It was I who called you. Here you see the pronoun I following the word was. Again, if we apply the rule, any pronoun that follows am, is, are, was, were, be, or been is required to use the subjective case. Going back to the list that we viewed previously, we know that I is subjective, me is objective. So we know that I would be the correct pronoun to use in this situation. The second example, the students I assisted could have been they. Again, apply the rule, am, is, are, was, were, be, or been. The pronoun follows the word been. So you must use the subjective case form they and not the objective case form them to properly apply the pronoun usage. The third rule summarizing when to use the subjective case includes any pronoun that appears after the words to be with no noun or pronoun before it. Examples, the shoppers appeared to be they. Again, in this sentence, we identify the pronoun they, and immediately before that, we see the words to be. In order to determine if we have the correct pronoun case form, we have to look in front of the words to be. Here, we do not see a noun or pronoun in front of to be, but rather a verb, the word appeared. When this situation is present in the sentence, then you have to use the subjective pronoun following the words to be. Again, subjective they, not objective them. Second example states, I would not wish to be he. Again, to be, you must look at what's in front of to be. The word wish is not a noun or pronoun as used in this sentence. So following the words to be, we need to use again the subjective case form he, not the objective case form him. Now let's look at the rules applying to the use of the objective case form. First of all, any pronoun that is the object of the verb, rather than the subject, the object of the verb or object of the action requires the objective pronoun. Examples, please return your application to me. In this sentence, we would identify the verb return and it's the object of that action, return it to me. So we would use the objective case form me, not the subjective case form I. In the second example, Jared met him at the seminar. Again, you identify the verb met and it's the object of that action, met him. So again, the objective case form him is correct, not the subjective case form he. The second rule applying to the use of the objective case form includes a pronoun that appears after to be, but this time we do have a noun or pronoun before it. Therefore, this time we must use the objective case, not the subjective case. Example, Mrs. Carver thought her to be me. Again, we look at the words to be in the sentence. We look at what's immediately in front of to be. In this case, the word her, which is another pronoun. When this applies in your sentence, then you have to select the objective case form after the words to be me being objective from our list, so we know that we have the correct pronoun usage. In the second example, the dean 
mistakenly believed the students to be us. Again, we find the words to be in the sentence. We look at what's in front of that, the word students, a noun. Therefore, we know that when we have a noun or pronoun before the words to be, we have to use the objective case form us, not the subjective case form we, to properly apply pronoun usage in this sentence. A third rule dealing with the use of objective pronoun case form is when the pronoun is the subject or object of an infinitive. Remember an infinitive is the word to plus a verb. In the first example, Beth asked her to send the copies to our home office. In the second example, please ask your assistant to send me the materials. In either case, whether you have her to send or to send me, whether it is the subject or the object of that infinitive phrase to send, in either situation, we will use the objective pronoun case form her in the first example, me in the second example. Finally, the possessive case form is always used to demonstrate ownership and belonging. Possessive pronouns are used in a sentence to indicate an ownership or belonging and includes words such as my or mine, your or yours, his, her or hers, its, our, ours, their, theirs, and whose. Remember when you are using possessive pronouns that possessive pronouns must agree in number and gender with the nouns represented in the sentence. Example, one of the men left his keys on the desk. Notice that only one of the men left his keys on the desk. So it would be incorrect to say their keys because we want to agree in number and their is plural, his is singular. His is also representative of the correct gender in agreement with the word men. In the second example, both of the women left their resumes with me. In this situation, we do need the plural possessive pronoun, their, because we're dealing with more than one. We're now discussing both of the women. More than one, plural, requires the plural case form, their. In forming sentences, remember that a sentence contains a complete thought. If a group of words provides only part of an idea, it is a fragment. We've talked about the basic parts of speech that you use to build a sentence. And as you build that sentence, you'll need a subject that answers who or what in relation to the verb, the action. And you'll need a predicate that includes the verb or verb phrase plus all modifiers. As you are forming your sentence, an important element to consider is your subject verb agreement. Every sentence must have a subject and predicate containing the predicate verb. The subject and verb must agree in number, meaning both must be either singular or plural. And it's important to remember that verbs ending with the letter S are singular. Here are some examples. With a singular word like dog, we use a singular verb. The dog runs. We know we have a singular verb, runs, because singular verbs end in S. With a plural word like dogs, we have plural more than one dog, so now to have subject verb agreement, we need a plural verb the dogs run. We would remove the letter S from the verb to indicate a plural verb form. A sentence in its natural order includes the subject first followed by the predicate. Example, horses, cows, and sheep are included in the livestock competition. The subject is plural, horses, cows, and sheep, requiring the plural verb 
are. If you invert the order of the sentence, the subject and verb still must agree in number. Meaning if I invert the order in this sentence and bring the back half of the sentence to the front and state, included in the livestock competition, are horses, cows, and sheep. Even though I have inverted the order, the subject and verb agreement must remain constant. The subject is still horses, cows, and sheep, plural, still requiring the plural verb form are for correct subject-verb agreement. Often expressions such as along with, as well as, in addition to, or including, are used after a subject. Remember to ignore these phrases when determining subject-verb agreement. Example, the auditor, as well as the manager, agrees to our proposal. When you are determining subject-verb agreement, you will mentally omit the phrase, as well as the manager, and notice that this intervening phrase is set off with commas. You will look only at what's in front of that, auditor, being singular, requiring the singular verb, agrees, and remember singular verbs end in S, so we know we have subject verb agreement. Singular auditor, singular verb agrees. When a sentence begins with there, the word there, the verb will be listed before the subject. This is an important tip to remember. You simply read the sentence carefully to identify if the subject is singular or plural, noting that the verb will be before the subject. Example, there are a computer, printer, and telephone to be shipped. Again, the sentence begins with the word there. That can never be your subject, but it's always a clue that the verb will come first, as is shown in our sentence, are, and the subject will follow. The subject is certainly plural. We have a computer, a printer, and a telephone. More than one, so we still require the plural verb form are. An additional subject verb tip to remember is the phrase a number of always requires a plural verb and the phrase the number of always requires a singular verb. Examples, a number of, there's that phrase, wonderful museums are in Chicago. Again, the phrase a number of always requires the plural verb and we have the plural verb, are, in this sentence. The second example, the number of, parking spaces has increased. Again, the phrase the number of always requires a singular verb and we have a singular verb, has, again ending in s. And another uh, subject verb tip includes remembering that titles of books or company names are always singular even if multiple words are listed because they represent only one title or only one company. Example, writing business plans, the title of a book, is an excellent book for entrepreneurs. Even though multiple words are included in this title, it's still just representing one book and therefore requires is the singular verb for subject verb agreement. Barnes and Noble, the name of a store, even though multiple words are used, it's still representing only one bookstore. So again, for subject verb agreement, the word is a singular verb is correct. Sentences beginning with the words each or every always require a singular verb. Examples, every cat and dog in the pet store is fed twice a day. Because this sentence begins with the word every, we're looking singularly or individually at every cat and dog. And therefore, the verb is would be correct, singular verb. Second example, each car and truck on the sales lot is washed on Tuesday. Again, we are looking singularly 
each car and truck. And because this sentence begins with the word each, we know that the singular verb form is would be correct. The effective use of grammar is critical in preparing your written communication. But not only does good grammar matter when you are preparing your sentence structure, but also the use of proper punctuation. And we'll examine the topic of proper punctuation usage in the next segment of this session. When preparing written communication, the effective use of punctuation is also very important. Let's begin by reviewing comma rules. There are several comma rules that you should be familiar with when preparing your written communication. The first comma rule states that you are to place a comma before a conjunction, such as and, but, or, or nor, when joining two complete independent thoughts. An example of a sentence using this rule includes, 20 computers were not working, comma, but we still completed the order on time. In this sentence, 20 computers were not working is the first complete independent thought, meaning it could stand alone as a sentence. It has a subject and predicate. The second complete independent thought is, we still completed the order on time. Again, it is a complete independent thought. could actually stand alone as a sentence. However, we want to join these two related thoughts into one sentence, and we can do that with a conjunction. In this sentence, the conjunction is but. We must add the comma before that conjunction because we are joining two complete independent thoughts. Notice, however, that no comma is required when a conjunction is used to join a complete independent thought with an incomplete thought. Again, let's look at the example. The administrative assistant plans to send the report by Monday, but cannot promise that it will arrive by Thursday. In this sentence, the administrative assistant plans to send the report by Monday, again, is a complete independent thought. But the second half of this sentence, cannot promise that it will arrive by Thursday, is a fragment because there is no subject in that portion of the sentence. Therefore, we do not need the comma in front of the conjunction when we are joining an independent thought with an incomplete thought. Rule number two states that we should separate three or more equally ranked words or phrases with commas. There are two examples. In the first example, we're stating Please purchase paper clips, comma, pens, comma, and envelopes. In this listing, we are simply separating those words in the series with commas. In the second example, a consultant was hired to improve customer service, comma, computerize the accounting system, comma, and implement new procedures. So remember, anytime you are joining three or more equally ranked words or phrases, be sure to separate those with commas. The next rule, rule number three, states set off with commas nouns used in a direct address. A direct address simply means that you are specifically targeting an individual or individuals in your written communication. In the sentence example, the book you ordered, comma, Mr. Green, comma, will be shipped next week. Mr. Green is the specific individual we are targeting our communication to in this sentence. That's what we mean by a direct address. When you use a direct address in your written communication, be sure to set that off with commas as shown in our example. Rule number four states, Separate three or more sections of a date with commas. Notice in this example, the meeting will be held on Thursday, comma, June 21, comma, at 2 p.m. 
we are separating the day of the week from the date and uh, month. If a year would also follow, that would be a, an additional section of the date and would also, of course, be set off with a comma. Please note that if only two sections of a date are used, such as a month and year, then you would not need to separate that with commas, only if three or more sections of a date are used. In item five, rule number five, we note that you are to use a comma to separate from the rest of the sentence a, a complete sentence that's set off in quotation marks. In the example, Mr. Applegate said, all employees will receive an extra day of vacation next year. All employees will receive an extra day of vacation next year is the complete sentence. It is set off with quotation marks because it indicates someone's exact words. When you are joining a complete sentence set off in quotation marks from the rest of the sentence, Mr. Applegate said, you should use the comma to separate these two sections of the sentence as shown in our example. Rule 6 states, separate with commas two or more independent adjectives that modify a common noun. An example, please enclose a stamped comma addressed envelope with your letter. To test whether an adjective is independent, you can reverse the words and add the word and, such as please enclosed an addressed and stamped envelope, meaning that each adjective is independent in its description of the word envelope. When you have two or more independent adjectives modifying that common noun, as shown in our sentence example, that common noun being envelope, you should set those two independent adjectives off with a comma. Rule number seven states, set off with commas a positive expressions that rename or explain the noun that appears directly before it but is not needed for identification. The example states, the new physician, comma, Dr. Jack Cole, comma, is now accepting patients. And a positive renames or explains immediately what is in front of it. In our sentence example, the appositive is Dr. Jack Cole. We have this information in the sentence set off with commas as shown in our example because it renames or explains immediately what's in front of it, the new physician. Rule number eight. Place a comma after an introductory expression used in a sentence. The first example, so that we may reach a decision quickly, comma, please send us your bid within the next two days. The introductory expression in this sentence is, so that we may reach a decision quickly. In the second example, after reviewing the case, comma, the attorney conducted additional investigation. Again, in this sentence, the introductory expression, after reviewing the case. Rule number nine, use commas for parenthetical expressions that interrupt the natural flow of the sentence and include words that are not necessary for grammatical completeness. Examples of parenthetical expressions include words such as, however, furthermore, Therefore, consequently, a partial list of parenthetical expressions is shown under rule number nine. Remember that to use the comma for a parenthetical expression, it must first of all interrupt the natural flow of the sentence, and secondly, not be necessary for grammatical completeness of the sentence. Let's take a look at the first example. However, comma, the new manager will be working weekends. In this sentence, the word however is the parenthetical expression. You can hear it interrupt the natural flow of the sentence. Also, 
it is not necessary for the grammatical completeness of the sentence, meaning we could take that word out and the sentence is still intact with the essential meaning of the new manager will be working weekends. In the second example, we use a parenthetical expression in the middle of the sentence. The new shipment, comma, consequently, comma, arrived in damaged condition. You definitely hear this parenthetical expression, consequently, interrupt the natural flow of the sentence. Also, again, the second test, we could remove this word from the sentence and the essential meaning is still intact. The new shipment arrived in damaged condition. So remember that when using a parenthetical expression, you should always set that off with commas when it does interrupt the natural flow of your sentence and is not necessary for grammatical completeness. Rule number 10 states, use a comma to separate the city and state in an inside address. An inside address is shown in a letter indicating the name and address of the individual to receive the correspondence. We would also use a comma to separate the city and state and a comma after the state when this information is used within a sentence. Example, Mrs. Knight moved to Dallas, comma, Texas, comma, last month. Again, the comma goes between the city and state, Dallas, comma, Texas, and also after the state, Texas, comma, last month. Now let's take a look at some semicolon rules. The first rule is shown here in item number 11. Place a semicolon between two or more closely related independent thoughts that are not connected with a coordinating conjunction. The example states, last week 27 orders were delayed, semicolon. Mr. Jones will investigate the situation. Here we again have two independent thoughts. Either half could stand alone as a sentence. Subject and predicate are present. Last week 27 orders were delayed. Mr. Jones will investigate the situation. Because these are related thoughts and we want to combine these in the same sentence, we choose not to use a coordinating conjunction. If you remember from our earlier rule, back in item number one, we said that when you have that coordinating conjunction, and, but, or nor, you would use this between the two complete independent thoughts with a comma. But in the semicolon example that we are looking at, we do not have the coordinating conjunction used to connect these two independent thoughts. Therefore, we use the semicolon rather than a comma to connect these two closely related independent thoughts. The second semicolon rule states that items in a series are usually separated with commas, again as we looked at in a previous comma rule. However, when one or more of the parts contain internal commas, then we must use semicolons to separate the items. Again, this is used for clarity in your writing. The example states, managers from Nashville, comma, Tennessee, semicolon, Chicago, comma, Illinois, semicolon, and Louisville, comma, Tucky, comma, attended the meeting. This includes items in a series. We are listing three city names including the states, Nashville, comma, Tennessee, Chicago, comma, Illinois, and Louisville, comma, Kentucky. Because these items in a series contain the internal comma between the city and state, we must use the semicolon after each item to prevent confusion for the reader so they clearly can identify each separate unit in the series. Notice after the last item when an additional listing is not following, you simply conclude that 
uh, in our example with the word Kentucky using a comma. Rule number 13, an additional semicolon rule, states use a semicolon before a transitional expression separating two complete thoughts. A comma should follow the transitional expression. The example states, all departments will have a challenge obtaining any budget increases this year. Semicolon, therefore, comma, members of your staff should carefully monitor expenses. Again, we have two complete independent thoughts. Could stand alone as a sentence. Subject and predicate are present. All departments will have a challenge obtaining any budget increases this year. Members of your staff should carefully monitor expenses. Both of these are again complete independent thoughts. We are choosing in this example to connect the two complete independent thoughts with a transitional expression. In this example, the word therefore. Note that when you use the transitional word therefore, to connect the two complete thoughts, you need a semicolon in front of the word therefore and a comma after. Don't confuse this rule with the parenthetical expression rule. Remember, in a par parenthetical expression, the word is interrupting the flow of the sentence and it does not include two complete independent thoughts on either side of that word although we often use the same words such as furthermore or therefore both as a parenthetical expression as well as a transitional expression. So it's important to note the use of punctuation according to these two rules depending on the circumstance. There's one colon rule I'd like to include in this session and that is rule number 14. Use a colon after a complete thought that introduces a formal listing or enumeration of items. The example states, the new supervisor requested that we order the following furniture and equipment, colon, three computer stations, comma, four desks, comma, and two color laser printers. In this example, we have the complete thought introducing a formal listing. The new supervisor requested that we order the following furniture and equipment. Then we complete the sentence with the items in the series, the formal listing. Notice that the colon is used to separate these two components in the sentence. Next we want to explore some period rules. We use the period of course at the end of a sentence, but let's identify the different classifications of sentences. Use a period at the end of a declarative sentence, an imperative statement or command, an indirect question, and a polite request. Polite requests end with a period even though they may appear to have the format of a question. A polite request will ask the reader to perform a specific action and is answered only by the reader's doing or not doing what the writer has requested. Let's begin with the declarative sentence example as shown. The manager announced a clearance sale on all merchandise. This is an example of a declarative sentence because we're simply declaring something, making a statement. The manager announced a clearance sale on all merchandise and we conclude that with a period. In the second example we have an imperative sentence or also referred to sometimes as a command. In these types of sentences the word you is understood. Please mail your check meaning you please mail your check. Conclude this type of statement with a period. The third is called a polite request. In this particular type of sentence, we are again asking the reader to take an action. 
will you please send your application by Monday? Notice that this is not concluded with a question mark because we do not want the reader to respond in words. We want the reader to respond with action. In our example, send your application by Monday. So whenever you want to say something very politely in a written format, you may use the polite request form, meaning you will add will you please to the begin, beginning of your sentence, but notice when you want the reader to respond with the action rather than the words, this type of sentence also concludes with a period. Rule number 16 reminds us that we are to use a period to indicate a decimal point in writing sums of money or decimal fraction. And remember, in sums of money, a decimal is not needed if no cents are expressed. The first example, the cost of the rent was $750 per month. In this example, there are no cents expressed, therefore the decimal and zero zero are not indicated. In the second example, the advertisements averaged $52.75 each. The use of cents are expressed in this sum of money and therefore we use the decimal or of course the period is used to indicate the separation between the quantity of dollars and cents. Next we'll look at two question mark rules. Number 17 states conclude a direct question that requires an answer with a question mark. The example reads, where is the new office building located? Question mark. The question mark signals to the reader that we are seeking a response in words. Number 18 states when a statement ends with a phrase that makes the sentence a question, we still of course require the question mark. The example states, you have been working with this committee a long time, haven't you? We of course begin this sentence with a statement, you have been working with this committee a long time. But we conclude this statement with a question, haven't you? Again seeking a response in words and we again use the question mark to signal that needed response to the reader. Finally we'll look at the exclamation mark rule. The exclamation mark is used in a sentence to indicate a high degree of emotion after a word, phrase, clause, or sentence. The example, yes I would like to attend the conference in California, showing again emotion after a statement can be relayed to the reader with the use of a question mark at, or excuse me, a exclamation mark at the conclusion of the statement. Remember these rules, punctuation rules, commas, semicolons, periods, question marks, and exclamation marks as you prepare your written communication to again ensure that your written communications project a quality image.